uh, as a professor, but most recently um, was Professor of Operations Management at the City University of Hong Kong until 2011. And after that, uh, since he's retired, he has been concentrating on a study of Chinese history, but more particularly on a study of uh, Chinese historical sources on Tibet. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present some of the research results. Uh, my title, of course, is the, to show that the official, authoritative, and primary source Chinese documents show that, uh, contrary to what the PRC has been claiming, uh, before 1950, Tibet was never part of China. Well, It's meant to be a political presentation. It's meant to be, a, it's, it's, it's meant to be an academic presentation, and I hope you're not too bored. Yeah, I hope you're not too bored by this. But, um, but uh, why must we talk about historical issues? Of course, as, as we know, uh, the PLC justification for refusing to negotiate with the Tibet government in exile, here I've dealt with the TGIE, uh, is that, well, Tibet refuses to uh, admit that Tibet has always been part of China since ancient times, so it's the fall of the TGIE. Also, of course, the PRC claims that what the PRC has been doing in Tibet uh, is to unify Tibet and, and not to invade or occupy Tibet. And again, the justification is that, well, Tibet has always been China since ancient times. Um, the PRC's position, if you are interested in looking at the details, uh, it's, um, it's outlined in uh, the document that's called Tibet, its ownership and human rights situation. Uh, that was published in 1992, but after that there were many other uh, subsequent white papers issued by the uh, PRC, which of course confirms the, the, the position. Um, to put it very briefly, the PRC's claim has sort of uh, have been revised. Earlier on, ancient times was interpreted as something back in the Tang Dynasty, but uh, after that they realized that that was a little bit too wild a claim, so now they have actually said that Tibet became part of China since the Yuan Dynasty. So since the PLC claims the ancient times start with the Yuan Dynasty, uh, what I do is just to try to prove that Tibet was independent of China, uh, of China uh, during the Yuan Dynasty, and then the Ming Dynasty, and then the Qing Dynasty, and then the uh, Republic of China era. So, so that's sort of the, the structure of my research. I also uh, want to emphasize that when I talk about Tibet today, uh, I'm really referring to what's today the um, Tibet autonomous region. The reason is that there's this huge area, uh, the ethnic Tibetan area, that's between today's TAR and China, I mean, primarily Sichuan and, and Qinghai provinces, and, and those are very, very murky. It becomes a little bit more complicated. But TAR is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, now, what I do actually is this, is that for each dynasty, Yuan, Ming, Qing, and Republic of China, uh, I will try to prove that Tibet is independent of China from a perspective of each of the Chinese administrative aspects. In other words, for example, uh, geography, uh, labeling, taxation, tributes, uh, census, education, and so forth. And the second part of each dynasty, then I'll look at individual events to use these events to prove that um, China never had any power, control, or governmental uh, function in, um, in Tibet. Um, in order to convince the Chinese and, of course, the, uh, to refute the claims of the PRC, uh, I only use valid, authentic, and credible Chinese documents uh, following the PRC's criteria. In other words, number one, I only use documents uh, that are written by uh, Chinese in Chinese language. Uh, they are published in China between, uh, uh, between 1279, which is Yuan Dynasty, and the beginning uh, of the PRC, which is 1949. There is a written in Chinese, by the Chinese, published in China during the Yuan and Ming and Qing Dynasty, and then on top of it has to be republished and reprinted by the PRC so that it proves that this is uh, something that uh, the PRC has accepted as a valid document. Um, also, most of the documents I'll be using, they're available uh, through the internet websites, uh, all printed by the PLC, uh, either PLC institutions or institutions that are approved or supported by the PLC government. 
Uh, in short, what I'm saying is that don't believe in a single word I'm saying. Uh, check it out. The only problem, of course, is that uh, you need to know how to read Chinese. <laughs> Um, today's talk, first I want to go through a very brief uh, introduction of uh, a Chinese historiography and Chinese history documents because the understanding uh, is necessary for us to sort of understand uh, why I'm claiming that the PLC are not telling the truth and that you have these uh, authoritative doc historical documents that are contradicting what you're claiming. Uh, and then after that, the primary objective is to then use these uh, Chinese uh, primary and primary, uh, semi-primary records to prove that um, Tibet was independent of China during the Ming Dynasty. I mentioned earlier that there were four dynasties that we look at, Yuan and Ming and Qing and the Republic of China, but of course we don't have time to look at all of those. So I'll really only look at Ming and Qing Dynasty. And for the Ming Dynasty, of course, again, there are many aspects, right? The administrative aspects of uh, taxation and census, whatever. Uh, we'll have time to only look at one of those. And then we'll look at how uh, these Chinese primary source documents classify uh, Chinese regions versus foreign regions. And for the section of indi an individual event, uh, I'll pick only one. And there's a story that's called how the Ming Emperor Wu Zhong attempted to invite a living Buddha from the Tibetan region. Uh, and then, of course, uh, <coughs> afterwards we'll talk about Qing Dynasty, the same thing. Uh, we look at some of the administrative aspects. I'll try to look at two of those. One is, again, the uh, geographic uh, classification of Chinese versus uh, foreign regions. And the second one, we're going to look at uh, census records uh, kept by China. And for individual event, we'll look at what's uh, known as the Guru Massacre, uh, which is something that happened during the second British invasion of Tibet. We'll look at the uh, the exchange of documents between the, the Chinese Amban and the uh, British commanding officer and we see what they say in those letters and compare that with what the PRC uh, version of what happened. Well, my secondary objective is to demonstrate to you um, how the PRC falsifies and distorts Chinese historical records. I'll just show you just the two versions, you know, the PRC version and the classical records you can compare yourself. <coughs> um, First of all, let me briefly introduce uh, what's called you know, Chinese historiography. In other words, what is considered authoritative. And that's, of course, a big issue in, 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 in bad history, is that we have the British version, the Chinese version, the PLC version, whatever, and so, I mean, who are you going to trust? Um, from the standpoint of the Chinese, okay, we look at Chinese historical authoritative sources. And what are these uh, authoritative sources? But the basic thing is that there's such a thing that's called the Comprehensive Four Library, Su Ku Chen Su. And uh, this is compiled, it was compiled by uh, one of the most famous emperors of China, Qianlong, uh, during the Qing Dynasty. And it's a imperial edict to collect all the good books in, in, in China you know, over the 2,000, 3,000 years. And it resulted in the largest action series of government collected series of books. Uh, it has uh, Four libraries, as you can see. Uh, the great one, histories, that's the one that we're going to concentrate. Uh, the whole collection has 3,400 titles. Basically, it's like the, the best 3,400 Chinese books that written in the past 3,000 years. That's really what it is. Um, and of course, you can see it's a huge thing with two, 2 million plus pages and uh, 800 million words. Um, now, within that, within that, sort of a huge number of books, there's this section that's called Zheng Su, which is called official history. The, the, the word Zheng Su is interesting because it means not only official history, it also means correct history. It is correct by governmental standard. Okay? And, and most Chinese actually accept it as, as really correct in the sense as truthful because these Chinese histories are really very truthful. Don't snicker at me because those of you who have experienced the PLC would think that, my goodness, are you talking about truthful Chinese history? Yes, I'm talking about truthful Chinese history as opposed to falsified PLC history. They're two very different things, okay? They're two very different things. Anyway, if you look at the system of uh, official Chinese history, first of all, there were these primary sources, and these things go back to okay, two, three hundred, I'm sorry, two, three thousand years of tradition. Is that uh, the, the, the imperial court, in fact, the courts of even uh, some of the local lords, they will hire people okay, to keep daily records. Uh, these daily records literally translated would mean rising and living records. When the ruler rises, you know, you have somebody recording everything that happens. Uh, now, what happens is that these 
they represent the careful ruler, and when the ruler, the emperor dies, his successor of that emperor will then appoint an editorial and office board consisting of the senior officials and the um, scholars, and then compile a set of veritable records. So there will be one set of veritable records for each emperor. And then the other primary sources would be the, all the submissions from the officials to the emperor and all the imperial edicts. Now these things are not only openly available, a lot of that is actually is, is available through the internet for free. And they are also available from PLC website. There's nothing secretive about it. I mean, these are open records. Um, now, I just say that we have the um, daily records, and the daily records are converted into the veritable records for each emperor. And so now we come to the tradition of what's called the correct or the official history of China is that then after the demise of every dynasty, the succeeding dynasty will then appoint a board to look at all the archival material and the veritable records of all the emperors, all the emperors of the preceding dynasty, and then you compile the history for the preceding dynasty. Then again, you might think that, well, this is not very real objective, right? Because they're talking about the pictures, writing the records, and beyond that, the pictures don't write very uh, sort of a, sort of a very honest history. If you have read these histories, you will not you will understand that that's not true. Victors do end up writing very at least in China. Okay, they do end up writing very truthful and very revealing uh, factual histories of the preceding dynasties because they all believe that it's such a, a succession of dynasties, right? And they don't think that's right uh, to uh, to tell lies about the preceding dynasties. Um, but in the table, you see uh, the, what you call the 24 histories, and the first one uh, is historical records. It was uh, about, about 2,000 plus years ago. The ones that are relevant to uh, our topic would be the, the 23rd item and the 24th item, the Yuan history and the Ming history in the, that's shown in red. And then the, the 25th history okay, is really part of this series, uh, and this Qing history. Now, the author. I'm sorry, not the author, the chief editor, there are many authors, as I said, it's a board of editors, editors of the board of authors. The chief editor, given in red over there, is Zhao Xin. And this is particularly significant for our discussion. The reason is that Zhao Xin's brother is Zhao Feng, and Zhao Feng, of course, is very well known as the butcher of Tibet. He's probably one of the most hated Chinese by the Tibetans. I, I think the Tibetan brothers of you probably uh, agree with me. Now this is actually turned out to be something that's very beneficial for the Japan cause is that uh, you can find somebody, okay, who is sort of more acceptable from the Chinese perspective. You're talking with the brother of somebody who has conquered or who unified a lot of Tibetans' land, and obviously he's not going to say something nice about the Tibetans, right? And but let's see what he has said. Okay, you'll, you'll be surprised at what he has said. Okay, uh, but anyway. Um, also, there's this term at the bottom of the slide that says Imperial um, Commission. A lot of these books are, are compiled by direct Imperial Edict, and again, that just reflects the, um, the authoritativeness of, of these documents, uh, at least from the criteria of the Chinese. Um, most of the material that I just mentioned, as I've said, again, they are available. Uh, from databases, most of them from free. Some of them uh, you have to go through a university, a library system to do it, uh, but you can you can easily check through most of these things, provided you can read Chinese. Um, the background information that I'm going to use, a lot of background information, I'll be citing from Baidu, as, uh, in case you have not heard of it. Baidu is the Chinese equivalent of Wikipedia and Google. In China, uh, most, I should say most, many of the areas, accessibility to Wikipedia and um, and Google, they're very limited, but they, they offer Baidu as an alternative. Okay? And, and, and instead of looking up a Wikipedia an article, you will look up a Baidu article. The content, obviously, is, you know, it will be somewhat different, but I am going to quote Baidu. In other words, I'm, I'm trying to better work backwards and say, well, these are all Chinese material that are accepted by PRC. Okay? Um, Okay, um, so we'll start with the first subtopic and then we'll look at the main dynasty and then we're going to talk about just one of the administrative aspects. We're going to see how Chinese versus foreign regions are classified and labeled in Chinese documents. First of all, I'm going to present the PLC version. So what does the PLC version say? It 
the most authoritative source today for the PLC version uh, is the, something that's called the Historical Atlas of China. Uh, that was commissioned by the PLC's Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, the chief editor is Han Qixiang. And if you look at Baidu, it just goes through it very briefly. Uh, Baidu basically says, well, this is it. This is one of, not one, one I'm sorry. This is the most authoritative uh, source of our historical geographic perspective. Okay? Um, so, is, is it common visible to everybody? Can you see the color? Okay. Okay, the, the color is important. The color is important over here because you can see that there is this area that corresponds roughly to today's China and it's colored. And the outside is white. But in the colored section, you can see there's a yellow section, and then you see the purple and then the green section. Right? Now, the, the PL, yeah, this color is much clearer. Okay, you can see that. that so the China PRC position is this. This is all China. But during Ming Dynasty, during Ming Dynasty, uh, they concede the fact that what is today's Xinjiang, what is today's Mongolia, they were still not part of Ming China, but it's China but not Ming China. So it has color, but it's not yellow. But the yellow part means that it was already part of Ming Empire. That's their position. Now it's interesting, of course, it's not surprising to see that not only are they showing that Tibet is a real part of Ming Empire, they are also showing that Manchuria is also, or was also part of the Ming Empire. Which of course leads to some rather interesting implication. It means that, uh, for those of you who know a little bit about, about Chinese history, is that, um, is that there's this villain that's called um, um, Wu Sangui, which of course is considered a traitor because uh, he was instrumental in, in, in in enabling the Manchurians to conquer China. Now, but according to this map, that would mean that Wu San Kui was actually a national hero that helped in the unification and not a traitor because, because the PLC is claiming that, well, there was no invasion, okay? Manchuria was already, already part of China. And, and on top of that, that would mean that some of these national heroes that we were taught as national heroes, uh, such as Su Kefa, uh, Yuan Chonghuan, which were national heroes that uh, defended the Hans against the Manchurian invasion, but according to this map, these are not national heroes. They, they are then, you know, I mean, people who impeded the unification of China, uh, they would be the splitters. So if you are able as a splitters by the PLC, you uh, in good company, okay? You are actually in the, uh, the, the company of people like Yuan Chonghuan and, and Su Kefa, which were actually you know, taught as our, our national heroes when, when I was studying Chinese. Uh, anyway, so this summarizes the, 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 the PLC version. But let's look at what we call the Chinese classics right now. Let's look at what Ming history says. Remember I said that there's such a thing as a correct official history of China, and then uh, the two items that we are interested in, Yuan history and Ming history, and then after that, that's the Qing history draft. So you, again, if you, you want to get a verification from Baidu, Baidu basically says the same thing in Ming history, it's one of the Chinese uh, official history, and it has 322 scrolls. Please remember that number, 332, uh, that's an important number because we will refer to that. And again, you can get that for free, uh, but go to the website, um, and these websites, one of them, in fact, uh, is funded by the PLC. It's a collaboration between uh, American institutions and, and, in fact, international institutions, including Chinese University. So the version of Ming history is actually provided by Zhejiang University. It's a photocopy of the original Qing Dynasty edition. Um, so, and this is the website. You can go there and you can see in red. I have sort of a large stack to say the sponsor is China American Digital Academy Library, uh, and it's contributed by Zhejiang University Library, which is one of the top research institutions of China. So none of these things can be fabricated. It's, it's all very straightforward. And again, as I said, it's free for you to, to look at those things. So this is a photo image. Uh, don't worry, I, I will translate everything in English. But for the, for the benefit of those who can read uh, uh, Chinese, uh, this is an example of the, uh, of the table of contents. And you can see that. They have uh, an area on geography, and what it says over here is that in Yunnan province, they list among other places Burma, okay, they list Burma, and then they list Laos, and this is the northern Thailand. Mm -hmm. In other words, 
China was never shy in claiming what they thought was China. So they were very, they were very, very straightforward in claiming that at that time, Burma, Laos, and Northern Thailand was part of the Yunnan province. Uh, and then, of course, uh, after that, they have foreign countries. And foreign countries, the first one is, is um, let me get to the point. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, then they have uh, Korea as foreign country. Foreign country one, and then Vietnam, and then Japan. And then after that, they have, uh, further down, they have Western lands three. The one with the arrowhead up there, that is the main justification of China's, I'm sorry, PRC's claim of sovereignty over uh, Tibet. That thing says, Tibet, commanding officer. And it shows that the main history very clearly records that China appointed commanding officer in Tibet. And this whole area, which is in great circles, they had different uh, sort of offices with titles like kings or whatever, they're all appointed by the uh, main government. So that's, that's the basis of uh, PRC's claim of sovereignty during the main empire. However, if you, I was going through that very fast, it's all in Chinese now. What I have to do is reorganize it, okay, and in English. And you guys see that the whole picture, if you look at it, will give you a totally different impression. You see, what we saw just now is that, you see that, of course, there are many pages, right? And I actually chart the table of contents itself is a little chart page. So you can see that the main history follows a 2000 year tradition of preparing official correct history. And what it does is that the first part would be the annals of main events, and then followed by astronomic uh, observations, then followed by Chinese geography. The Chinese geography in main history includes Beijing, Nanjing, and the clearly listed 13 provinces, and they're namely Shandong, Shanxi, Henan, Shanxi, blah, 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 and so forth. Uh, and that is how traditionally Chinese ter territories have been recognized. Okay, it's a formal recognition method or system that has been followed for the past 2,000 years. If this is a Chinese territory, it will be there. And of course, sure now, what I showed you just now is that within Geography 7, which is in this section, uh, Yunnan includes Burma, includes Laos, includes Northern Thailand. Nothing about Tibet is mentioned. There's no Tibet there in the Chinese geography section. That geography section spans over 300 pages. It's just a complete listing of all the provinces, all the prefectures, all the counties, and all the basic information. Every piece of land is sort of like you owned by China. And Tibet is that, okay? Tibet, which is used uh, as sort of a user over here, um, we'll see that much later, actually. So anyway, after what is so closely related to China, which is given over this part, then there are other things about China that will occupy the rest of uh, the 332 volumes of main history. And then later on, there will be things that are much less relevant to China. And you look at the third to the last row, you have a bunch of these uh, ethnic rulers, and Burma, Laos, and Northern Thailand, they are mentioned again, and they are again in red. Okay? In other words, Ming Dynasty represents, I mean, recognizes the fact that, well, Burma and Laos was part of China, but they were ruled by ethnic rulers. In the last two sections, uh, relegated to the last two sections, then are places that are really quite irrelevant to China. And they are divided into two sections. The first section, foreign countries, one to nine, and among the uh, countries that are recorded, uh, Korea, Vietnam, and even Holland and Italy. <laughs> and then after that, remember just now, I asked you to remember the number 332. There are 332 volumes, and in the last four volumes, Western lands, that's where Tibet is shown. Okay, so when I show you just now the commanding officer, that was actually relegated to the second last section of the entire book, behind Holland and behind Italy. Now, if you look at the arrangement, it becomes very obvious, okay, that, that no, okay, Tibet was a part of China. China recorded the fact that they conferred or gave titles to some of these Tibetans 
but they also realize or recognize that these places are so, just so remote and so irrelevant to China that they qualify for the second last volume of the book behind Korea, behind Holland, behind Italy. Uh, in fact, if you look at volume scroll, we call scroll 331, if you look at the entities right now to relook at it, okay, PRC stresses this point. Look at this. Office of the commander, you know, we want to commander that. But actually in that section, if you look at the uh, Tibetan regions, okay, this is the Tibetan region, uh, there are some of these what you call religious kings, I, I think many of you probably know that uh, the, the Ming Empire, uh, the Ming Empire conferred uh, Tibetan, uh, conferred these titles to Tibetans, uh, their religious kings, spiritual kings, they are translated different ways, but the, the PRC way is to translate them as religious kings, and then the Wang will be spiritual king. And then, of course, this is the main one, the one in Tibet, which is this TAR, um, the office commander. But then it also includes Nepal, but it's even more interesting, it includes a country uh, that is called Western Heaven and Virtual Nation, which the Chinese documents themselves admit that they have no idea where this country is. Okay? Some, some envoy just came in some little tributes and, and, and left the president, and then they were never seen again. Okay? So, so that, that is, that, in you know, other words, Tibet is grouped with all these, these other countries, the power of this Western heaven and an virtuous nation, and, and that's it. Yeah. And then, of course, if you, you look down over here in the last row, uh, in scroll 332, uh, there are 32 other entities listed, and it includes uh, Samarkand and Medina and Mecca, which, of course, yeah, it's based on the world. Um, Okay, you might object, because I should have explained earlier that um, these Histories, they are compiled by the succeeding dynasties. So Ming history was compiled by the Qing regime. And you may say, wait a minute, that might be unfair, you know? I mean, these Qing people, they might have belittled the uh, achievements or the territorial expense of, of the Ming Empire. Well, let's look at a Ming record then. Again, just now I was explaining the tradition of uh, Chinese official history. There's another tradition that's called the uh, unification record, the geography records. China, since about 680, has been compiling these comprehensive, contemporaneous geography documents. Uh, so uh, the first one is, uh, as I said, is in the Tang Dynasty. And if you, if you look at the, uh, the main unification record, which is actually the catalog of all the geographic ter uh, territorial units of the entire contemporary uh, contemporaneous um, territory story. Uh, so this is again just an extract from Baidu. Uh, it, it gives you a sort of a whole, whole information, uh, whole set of information about the document. Importantly, you can see that it follows the tradition, tradition of the Great Yuan unification records, and Yuan, of course, in turn for the Tang Dynasty and so forth and so forth. And so it was compiled by an emperor, uh, and then it was it was it was uh, done by. A, a group of, of uh, important authors and whatever, and then it was revised because Ming Dynasty spanned over three, uh, 280 years, so actually this record was sort of revised several times. Um, so let's look at the structure. I would not bore you with the uh, full image anymore since you're Chinese, but if you look at it, English translation, uh, there are 90 schools all together, and the same thing is repeated, and that is uh, if you look at school number 87, they again claim that Burma, Thailand, and Laos are part of the United Province. In fact, in the main document, they don't even bother to uh, emphasize the fact that Burma and Laos was ethnic sort of areas that were really, you know, ruled by ethnic rulers over here to just put it as part of Yunnan. Okay? And then in contrast, Again, relegated to the last two scrolls of 89 and 90, and they are explicitly labeled as white meat, foreign aliens. So it, it can be really translated as foreign foreign. You cannot be more foreign than foreign foreign. <laughs> um, so if you look at these, these places, they are labeled as foreign aliens. The first one is Korea, the second one is Manchuria, uh, the third one is Japan, the fourth one is Ryukyu, and the fifth one is Japan. And then after that, you have 16 other entities, and then in scroll 90, uh, you have the continuation of all these foreign aliens in your Vietnam, Syria, Java, Medina, and, and the whole bunch of other So again, if you look at the structure and labeling, it becomes very obvious. We don't have time to look at the, the actual content. Okay? I'm just showing you the table of 
content, or even a table of content, the structure becomes actually very obvious. What the main empire thought at that time. So anyway, so this is just uh, uh, 40 meg of, uh, of this. Incidentally, as you can see, the great main unification record, the structure which was just shown over here, consists of 5,600 pages. It's a very, very detailed record of everything that belongs to China. And it could possibly have missed such a big piece of land, a big piece of real estate at the back, and it, after this 5,600 pages of record. So anyway, but this is to show you that Inan, again, that is that that that, that red thing, Inan and Inan has this part where I circle it in red, and that shows it that Burma and Laos is part of Yunnan province in China. And then of course, then you have the arrow over there shows the foreign foreigners, and then the first one is Korea, and then after they have Japan, and then I circle it, and that part is Japan. Good. And then after that, you have a whole bunch of other countries like Vietnam and blah, 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 and so forth. And these two arrows, they show you the two places, Mecca and Medina, which is in today's like Saudi Arabia. So, to go further, this record, or this document, which is called the Great Ming Unification Record, which is a thick compiled uh, by Imperial Edict, by the Ming Empire, there's a whole bunch of, uh, basically, it, it, there's a lot of, uh, uh, bragging, uh, I'll translate it, um, and bragging actually goes this way. So this is this is the preface, it's written by the Ming Emperor. So the Ming Emperor says, since ancient times, emperors ruling the world prosper by unifying the world sea. World sea, many of you probably heard of the term Tianxia. In Chinese, okay, we say, under the world, we really don't mean the entire world, we mean the world that's relevant to Chinese. Okay? So the world's uh, subscript C has two meanings, but over here it says, well, we are unifying the world, uh, but it is a Chinese world, and, and we the Imperial Ming family, by having this mandate, unify all Chinese and Asians. Again, again, people believe that once you're a Chinese emperor, of course, you own the world. Uh, but then, then our territory is truly vast. Eastward, it reaches the east of, of at the end of, of Liao, which is, of course, Manchuria. Westward it reaches in the Xinjiang Desert, and southward it reaches the ocean, northward it reaches the northern uh, desert. Uh, it doesn't mention Tibet, it goes a little bit northwest to Xinjiang, but not Tibet. Okay? And then, of course, on top of that, they also, of course, brag about the fact that lands in all directions, without exception, come to a court to pay their respect. And so countries like Holland and, 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 and Italy and, and Java and Tibet, they are those lands in all directions and without exceptions come to a court to pay their respect, but they are really not part of China. And to confirm that further, you can see that they then state, they say, as to governing within our own national boundaries, they are the capital cities, the world sea, and what is relevant to the Chinese, again, okay, to our Chinese world, is divided into 13 provinces and they are explicitly listed after that, and that's it, there's nothing more. I mean, Tibet is not part of the part of the world sea that is within our national boundaries. Of course, what is Tibet? Tibet is, in the last part of the slide, it says that uh, they belong to those aliens from all directions to whom we confer official titles and we submit to a subordination protocol. Even if not part of our, within our national boundaries. So we stay the right way. Now, uh, after that, they have a map, and this map is very explicit, and you should all have it uh, in case I was just worried that you might not be able to see the screen. Uh, you should have that in front of you. Um, if you look at it, have that. There's a sheet in here. Do you have What? Yeah, I, I, I hope you should have it. Yeah, but if you can, if you can see the screen, it's, it's visible, you can look at the screen. Um, now you can see that this is very very special. The Chinese areas that are considered as, China, as part of China within the Ming Empire, they are in black background and white text and frame. So the frame here, that's a black background with the white character. Okay? So this is the capital city, this is the Shaanxi province, uh, this is Fujian province, this is Guangdong province. Okay? On the other hand, if you look at these non-Chinese areas, this is Korea, as you can see Korea over here, this is white background, black lettering, and uh, not frame. You look at 
Korea, you look at Japan, and then you look at Tibet, it's the same form. <laughs> so again, it's very, literally it's black and white. One is black, one is black background and white naturally, and the other one is just in the okay? Thank you very much. Anyway, so, uh, let's look at what we have just seen, the great main um, unification record. And see what the implication is. This book is prepared conforming to a centuries-old tradition of the central government of China preparing a complete catalog of territories. It's commissioned directly by the Ming emperors, several of them actually, in succession. It's jointly compiled and, commit, and submitted to the emperor by several dozens of senior court scholars and officers. In this case, it was compiled by a board consisting of 51 leading scholars. And then the emperor personally approved it and write the preface. In fact, the Chinese name for this book is called Imperially Approved Great Ming Unification Record. Okay? And the emperor write the preface. And then you can see that in this book, Tibet is not only excluded from the China section, but then it's labeled as a foreign entity and then grouped explicitly with many other equally foreign entities, including, for example, Japan and Italy and so forth. Um, and then, of course, the map sort of confirmed one form with this black and white contract. Uh, in my opinion, it's difficult to imagine a more explicit and authoritative proof that uh, Tibet was not part of Ming China as considered by the Ming government. Uh, anyway, the Ming dynasty uh, extended over 280 years, and of course, territories changed over the years, right? So, what you have over here is the one that was published in 1461, and they have revised it several times, as I've mentioned just now. The one that I'm showing on the screen right now is a revised edition shown in 1600, and I purposely went to the website of something that's outside China to do it. Okay? You can get this from the Chinese website too, but this one is from the German Bavarian uh, State Library to emphasize one fact, and that is these documents cannot be, doctored, cannot be falsified because copies of this are held in many libraries throughout the world. So anyway, you can see that this one compared to this one, uh, in fact that's the reason why I, I edited this one out. I want you to compare, to be able to compare this one, which is the preceding one, the earlier one, 1461, and this one over here. And you can see that this one, the contrast is not that obvious, but it's still pretty obvious. What you have over here is that the Chinese areas are all framed. Okay? And then the non-Chinese areas like Japan and Korea and this over here, Tibet, they are not friends. So it's not literally black and white anymore, but still it's a contrast between the non-frame labeling and then the frame labeling. So anyway, given that, we now have three versions. The PRC version, the Ming history version, which is written by the Qing dynasty people, and of course the Ming version, which is compiled by the, uh, by the Ming Empire. Uh, and then if you re read the, uh, what the, the, the Baidu article has to say about the, the, the stature and the prestige of the author and of the historical atlas of China which was published by PRC, uh, you can see, well, it's kind of uh, amusing, okay? You see that. Uh, so uh, this summarizes uh, the, the, the three official documents that we have seen so far. Uh, the bottom line is the oldest one, it's the Ming Dynasty one, and then of course the middle one is Qing, and then the top one is of course the PRC version. And you can see that the Qing version and Ming version, they very much agree with each other, and it's the Ming version of Ming history, uh, I'm sorry, the Qing version of Ming territories, they said, well, Northern Thailand and Laos, they are inside the Ming Empire. And then the Ming document says the same thing. And there is Northern Ireland and Laos, they are inside the Ming Empire. Whereas Tibet is outside of the Ming Empire. So is, or so was Manchuria. You can see that in the PRC document, it's just the opposite, okay? It's like left and right reversed. Thailand and Laos becomes foreign, okay, because they would want to, you know, today, they would dare to say that Thailand and Laos are part of China, so anyway. So it's over here, 
whereas when Korea and Tibet becomes left, okay, so what the main document and the chain document is done is still uh, direct opposite. So 